This is a rare case in which I talk about some of my own work. It's about the biggest current controversy in astrophysics. Does dark matter exist or do we instead need to change the law of gravity? If you've followed me for some while, then you'll know that my opinion on this has switched back and forth a few times. In this most recent iteration, it's flipped back to it's probably dark matter. Then again, it's complicated. Let's have a look. It's one of those problems that's easy to understand, but very difficult to solve. Let's look as an example at a galaxy like the Milky Way. That's a spiral galaxy. We can use Einstein's theory of general relativity to calculate how fast the stars in these spiral arms should move. The velocity of these stars is the function of the distance from the center of the galaxy. The closer they are to the center, the faster they need to move to stay on a stable orbit. If you plot the dependence of the velocity of the stars as a function of the distance from the center, as you calculate it with Einstein's theory, then that function drops. It's called a rotation curve. The problem is that for most galaxies we observe, these rotation curves do not drop. For stars far away from the galactic center, they remain roughly constant. This is what's called a flat rotation curve. It's also the case for the Milky Way. So we have an observation that doesn't agree with the prediction. That is bad. The dark matter solution is now to say, well, there's just more stuff in the Milky Way and that increases the mass that's pulling on the stars. Galaxies all have a big halo of dark matter. It's just that we can't see this stuff and it goes right through us. And if there's more mass pulling on the stars, then they'll move faster. The alternative idea has become known as modified Newtonian dynamics, MOND for short. It's to say that the mass remains what it is. Instead, if you get to the far out stars, then the gravitational force is just stronger. This is the basic idea put forward by Mordechai Milgram already in 1983. Now, of course, you can't just change the gravitational force as you please, because we've tested this gazillions of times on our own planet and in the solar system. Every time Elon Musk launches a satellite, he's testing the law of gravity and he don't mess with Elon. So, Milgram said, the law of gravity changes only when accelerations are very small. And remember that acceleration depends on the force. Near this planet or in the solar system in general, the gravitational force is fairly strong. But the gravitational force coming from the overall mass of the galaxy becomes quite weak the further away you are from the center. And then this new law kicks in. The typical acceleration scale at which it takes over is usually called a naught. Amazingly enough, it turned out that this simple idea indeed works for a lot of galaxies and with the almost same acceleration scale as a crossover. It looks and feels like a new fundamental law. Better still, Mond gives rise to some correlations between observables, like that between the mass of the galaxy and the asymptotic velocity, and that fits with observations. For some types of galaxies, this was a prediction that was later found to be correct. Yes, Mond has problems with some observations, like big galaxy clusters. But then again, dark matter also has problems with some kinds of observations, like galactic cores. So it's not that easy to decide which one's better. There have been some papers claiming that this universal acceleration scale actually doesn't work, because there are some galaxies for which it doesn't fit. But as other researchers have pointed out, that's not a good argument, because an exception doesn't make the rule go away. It's like saying John got measles even though he was vaccinated, therefore vaccines don't work. But then how do you explain the drop of measles cases following vaccination campaigns? It's a similar problem with MOND. We know that it works for a lot of galaxies and no matter how much you torture the data, that isn't going away. The question is, how do you explain this? The issue with most of these studies is that they don't actually compare MOND and dark matter. They they say MOND is bad or dark matter is bad, but okay, so they're both bad. That doesn't help us. We want to know which is the least bad. And this brings me to our new paper. And I should say that actually I did pretty much nothing. The work was all done by Maria and Anton. I just said that it would be an interesting question to look at. This paper is on the preprint server. It has not yet been peer reviewed.
We looked at a sample of about 150 galaxies and asked what works better to explain the observed rotation curves, dark matter or MOND. The relevant thing to know is that MOND has fewer numbers to adjust for each galaxy than dark matter. For dark matter you have to say how much of the stuff is there and how it's distributed, whereas for MOND you have just this one acceleration scale. So the question is whether the additional parameters in the dark matter model are justified by the improvements in data fitting? The brief answer is yes, as you see in this figure. More galaxies are fit well by dark matter than by MOND, even accounting for the difference in parameters. The reason is that there are some galaxies which just won't fit with the idea that the universal parameter is actually universal. Even more worrying, the galaxies for which MOND works better are those for which there are few data data points or the data points have large uncertainties. In this figure, the vertical axis is a measure for the uncertainty of the data. And you see that the higher the uncertainty, the more magenta points that are the galaxies better fit with MOND. This makes it seem like MOND is preferred for cases in which there's little data to fit just because MOND has fewer parameters. It looks like MOND is just an artifact of statistical analysis. Now I have to be honest when I first saw this result, I thought it must be wrong. Because we know from other studies that MOND actually works well to explain even small details in rotation curves because there are features in the visible meta distribution that fit with features of the rotation curve. This is known as Renzo's rule and you see an example in this figure. See how the visible meta traces the rotation curves. So this Renzo rule doesn't fit together in my head with the results from our paper. Then again, Again, this is the result and we can't just sweep it under the rug. It's also compatible with the other study that I talked about recently on wide binary systems that found MOND works better if one includes low quality data. So this is why at the moment I've kind of flipped back from MOND to dark matter. But who knows, maybe I'll change my mind with the next paper. So stay tuned. Did you know there's a free and easy way to learn more about the science behind all the videos you've been watching? Yes, there is. Go and check out Brilliant.org who've been sponsoring this video. On Brilliant you find courses on a large variety of topics in science, computer science and mathematics. It's a fresh and new approach to learning that makes growing your knowledge easy and fun. I've learned so much there. All their courses come with interactive visualizations and follow-up questions. Some also have videos for demonstration experiments or executable Python scripts. This really gives you a feeling for what's going on. I even have my own course there. That's an introduction to quantum mechanics. It'll bring you up to speed on all the basics, interference, superpositions, entanglement, and up to the uncertainty principle and Bell's theorem. Brilliant is really the best place to build up your background knowledge on all those science videos which you've been watching. You can try it out for free for 30 days. But if you go there, use our link brilliant.org slash Sabine because the first 200 to use our link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and give it a try. Brilliant is time well spent. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.